All right. So welcome everybody to our uh, industry hour this week. Our major we are highlighting is industrial and management engineering. Um, we'll go through the major and I'll introduce our panelists um, and we'll kind of talk about some resources to just to cover all of our bases on how to become uh, an IME or uh, ISE. You'll discover that this major has many names. Um, so it's very interchangeable, industrial management, industrial and systems, um, engineering. Um, and so uh, I guess I should also introduce myself. My name is Kelly Stutz. I'm one of the SOE Hub Advisors. Um, I have my colleague, Kim Loring, here as well. And we are advisors in the SOE Hub. Uh, so if you are interested in this major, um, to all of our undeclareds out there, um, you can see your Hub Advisor and we can help you change to this major. And um, hopefully we can get you interested in major today after hearing about our panelists. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen see all right cool kim can you see that awesome so um like i said this uh major goes by many different names so you'll see i i think in the proper coding in the back end is mgte which makes it even more confusing because it looks like your management um however you'll focus more on the isye ime or ise all of those mean um the industrial and management engineering degree here at rpi so our agenda today is we'll talk a little bit about the CCPD or the Center for Career and Professional Development. Um, I'll introduce our panelists. We have two Rensselaer alumni and two current students. And then we'll do an interview and a little Q&A. So any questions that you have, please feel free to put them in the chat and then we will go over them at the end of our presentation. So a little bit about the CCPD. Um, we have engineering career counselors at RPI, so they are uh, specific counselors to help you find internships, uh, jobs, resume, uh, structure, uh, interview tips, all for uh, engineering. And they can help you with your Arch Away semester as well um, and those opportunities. So definitely uh, two people that you want to meet with um, before you graduate. Some of their services and resources they offer. Um, they have major in career exploration, developing application materials, you know, post grad, applying to grad school, med school, um, your LinkedIn, and then the career fair prep. Uh, just a plug the career fair is this week, so please check your email for more information. There's a virtual and an in person. Um, so, to prepare for that, I, I think the CCPD is hosting a few events this week, um, but also they have a clothing closet. So, something to ask about. Out, um, or inquire to see if they have um, something that can fit your style um, for the in-person career fair. You will make an appointment with them through Handshake. That's also where you'll find other RPI um, jobs and uh, internship opportunities to apply to. So um, lots of awesome resources in Handshake. So I definitely recommend making your account today um, and then meeting with Emily or Kristen to uh, find what's best for you and what you're looking for in your um, career. Some employment relations uh, for industrial and management. Um, some of these will look super familiar to you. Um, I'll just say this, that IME is needed in all corporations. Um, these corporations wanna know how they can be the most efficient, how they manage human factors, how they manage other factors, and what that looks like, it's all kind of combined. So the IME is the center of all engineering, and you're basically working with all engineers. And I think our panelists can go into a little more detail about that today, um, but just to give you an idea of some employment opportunities in your future. Just a little bit of a, a salary. Um, this is from our class of 2022. You'll see IME is a little bit towards the middle here, um, but the average is about 77,000. Your range you're looking at 63 to 112, so quite a gap, um, but it just depends on the area that you end up in. Um, and then there's always ways to build around, but in things like this are where you'll work with the CCPD um, and kind of narrow down, you know, how do you feel like you're being properly compensated um, and what that looks like. All right, so I'm going to introduce our um, industry hour panelists um, and I will have them introduce themselves uh, just so they can give you a little bit of a background, um, your name, your work history, where you're from, uh, where you live now, and a degree in other schools you may have attended um, if it wasn't just RPI. So I'll stop sharing my screen here and we'll start with Jim. Okay, hello everybody out there. Uh, yeah, so Jim DeViro, um, 
I graduated uh, out of the IME program back in 1986. Um, I proceeded to get my master's. I went to work for IBM uh, right out of uh, RPI. I was I had like an internship over the summer, and then they offered me a position then. Um, I then got my master's in IME um, through the next couple of years. I think I got out in 1988. So um, I, I say initially I worked uh, in a traditional manufacturing setting. So I was like supporting the uh, building of IBM's mainframe. So it was a traditional uh, IME process, you know, uh, procedures, what type of procedures were we using to, to build the mainframe? Now, obviously over the years, the mainframe computer is now, you know, has the, this, this laptop that I'm participating on has got more processing power than, than, the, than what the mainframe had. So technology obviously has evolved. So um, I worked 12 years in IBM and I went from the manufacturing side of it to um, more of what customers, I had a desire to understand what customers were, were using the technology for. So that got me into more of the traditional IT world. And part of the group that I was in was actually building the beginnings of the internet. So um, uh, yes, believe it or not, I was, I was around and working before the internet was there or before there was a mobile phone that you could connect to it. So um, I've seen that technology evolve over the years. I, I now am a, a director in AT and T. Across, sometimes in some of your uh, experiences, there's mergers and acquisitions and things like that. You get bought and sold, and so I was purchased in, as part of a big corp two between AT and T and IBM. They got together and they sold some part, and some people became AT and T employees, and some people became IBM employees. So I became an AT&T employee and um, I got into basically network operations, which was running basically a portion of the internet today. So um, that's basically where my career has been spent is in network operations. I now have evolved to like every cell site that's around the country. I'm a director of a center that is responsible for um, connectivity from that cell site to other telecommunications equipment, which, you know, your your phone connects to the cell site that's wireless. We say that that's wireless technology. Once you hit the cell site, everything's wired. It's fiber optics, it's all that type of thing. So that's basically where I am now. Um, that's what I'm doing. And uh, I live here in Albany, New York still. So awesome. I've Thanks, traveled Jim. a little bit, but I've got back home. <laughs> Always in upstate New York. Yeah. Awesome. Colleen, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so my name is Colleen Cunningham. I graduated with uh, from the IME program in 2005. Um, since then, uh, you know, basically right from graduating, I went to work for a company that actually no longer technically exists, United Technologies, um, in one of, it was called the Operations Leadership Program. So it was a, ro a two-year rotational program. Um, heavy, similar to Jim, heavy on the sort of the manufacturing operations side of industrial engineering. I did a few different rotations, a, a lot around continuous improvement um, and uh, supply chain. Uh, after doing that program, I uh, went to go work at a company that was part of UTC at the time called Carrier, which has a big air conditioning and refrigeration manufacturing company. I worked there for seven years, um, did a variety of different roles. I was in quality uh, warranty analysis. I was in new product development. I was a commodity manager in supply chain for a little bit. During my time at Carrier, I also uh, went back to school part-time, uh, which was paid for by my company. I got my MBA from the University of Connecticut. Um, after the seven years at Carrier, I transitioned over to UTC corporate headquarters, and uh, I was in the operations group there, and I um, had a role which is sometimes kind of seems ambiguous. I was the chief of staff to the SVP of operations of UTC. So kind of his right hand person uh, preparing all of his slides and prepping him for all his meetings and really kind of organizing all of the different councils and whatnot that we had at UTC and operations. 
uh, after that, so after that role, I, I, I think I, I, I like to say I kind of found my true passion, um, which was in human resources. So I've been working in human resources for the past eight years or so. Um, my first role that I was able to sort of, you know, within this company with an 11 year career in operations say, hey, I want to try something a little bit different. What do you think? Um, I went into HR and I ran what was called uh, learning operations. So instead of um, managing vendors that were supplying parts, I was managing vendors uh, with my supply chain background that were providing learning or um, you know technology and tools for employees to learn. I also had oversight of our leadership development facilities. So I had to put a little bit of that hat on and understand how you know how do you do facilities management how do you work with those types of vendors and and efficiently run a building um and did that for for a bit and then um transitioned into more sort of traditional talent hr work i ran our performance uh process our employee engagement process for utc and then in 2020 april 2020 um we mer merged with raytheon so now i work for a company called raytheon technologies which was the merger of Raytheon and United Technologies, we spun off some of the um, commercial businesses. So Otis Elevator, Carrier, uh, Air Conditioners, those are standalone companies now, and we're really a pure play aerospace and defense company. Um, and my roles in this company uh, currently and kind of for the past three years have been in really pure talent management space. So my current role is I'm the director of talent for enterprise services and digital technology. And my responsibilities are really sort of understanding the full workforce that we have in that in that area. It's about a, a department of, of close to 5,000 people and growing um, all of our digital technology. So a lot of the stuff that Jim does, if he worked at uh, if he worked at Randy and we probably worked together. Um, but then also all of our back office shared services type of work, like accounts payable and um, financial services, real estate services, kind of all falls in this group. So it's been it's been an interesting journey from my IME days, but I'll uh, I'll let you know how it all ties later when we talk. So that's awesome. Thanks, Colleen. All right, Susan, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm Susan, a senior industrial man management engineering and design innovation and society dual at RPI. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and over the past eight months, um, I did a supply chain co-op at Unilever on a Kroger customer experience team. So like the way Unilever is organized is um, they're a manufacturing company. They make consumer uh, packaged goods and they sell them to their top retailers such as uh, Walmart, uh, Kroger, Costco, and et cetera. And um, over this summer, I also did an internship um, as a CLDP, which, is, which stands for Chase Leadership Development Program um, intern at uh, JP Morgan Chase in the auto shop and finance team. And um, the as an introduction of the CLDP program, it's um, like what Colleen mentioned before, um, Chase has a two-year rotational program uh, where they place you into um, three rotations um, in one of their lines of business. And I happen to be um, in the auto shop and finance um, team over the summer. Um, learning about how Chase built their um, auto financing tools online and how they um, try to gauge a specific key performance metrics um, to increase um, the number of customers in their customer base. Very cool. Thanks, Susan. All right, Liam, you're up. Hey, how's it going, everyone? My name is Liam Bywater. I am a fifth year graduate Coterno student in the Systems Engineering and Technology Management program. Uh, also attended RPI from undergrad in Industrial and Management Engineering, so very familiar with the program through and through. I am from Newburgh, New York, about an hour and a half south of here, right in the Hudson River Valley, and still reside, reside in Troy as I'm finishing up my master's this semester. Um, for work history, I've had the opportunity to have three internships with a construction management firm named Whiting Turner. Um, the arts program provided me with a very nice opportunity during my sophomore year. Um, that summer was obviously COVID was still very prevalent and we were predominantly online at RPI. I only had three courses at the time, so I was fully remote at the time. So I was able to work full time uh, as an intern and was able to take that fall off for the arts away semester. So I had the opportunity to do a nice eight month co-op and then returned both summers 
uh, following in 2022 and this past summer as well, and plan to start working for them full time in 2024, um, working in the construction management field. Awesome. Well, we definitely have a range here today. And I'm really excited to hear everyone's perspective. So um, we'll start with our first question. Um, what made you decide to be an industrial and management engineer? Very simple. And we'll start with Jim. Yeah, so I guess um, my background was kind of the traditional, um, I'm good in math, I'm good in science, but I don't, don't, don't bring any circuits near me or you don't want me to build a bridge. Um, so I, I, I had kind of a, and I felt like I had a people side, right? And I loved, and I liked the fact of dealing with money and, you know, finances. And so I was kind of looking for that mix. Um, so I had put in the rigor of, you know, your two years of your physics and your calculus and you do all of that. And it's like, okay, but I, I need something more human. And, uh, so that's kind of what led me to this. I don't want to say it was a process of elimination, but it sort of was, it was like, you know, you go to make your determination. It's like mechanical. Nope. Electrical. Nope. Materials. Nope. Okay. So this, this looks interesting. And, um, and honestly, to this day, I believe it was the best decision that I made um, because uh, what is it is so encouraging is if you listen to just listen to Susan and Liam and Colleen, I wrote down that we had people doing manufacturing, IT, I'm in network technology, some finance, HR, construction management. There's how many different fields did we just touch? And we only have three of us here. You know, you talk about the medical field, you know, every business has got processes. Every business has to operate and every business involves getting people, processes and money, whether capital or expense, whatever it is together. So that's what led me to it. And uh, I'm still very much high on the degree and uh, would tell anybody that uh, it's a great choice. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. This question is also for you, Colleen. All right. So I'll I'll be fully transparent. So when I applied and started at RPI, I was a biomedical engineering major. I was very determined at 17 years old that I knew that I wanted to be in biomedical engineering. Did I know what that meant? Absolutely not. But I was very similar to Jim. Super good at math, super good at science didn't really like history, didn't really love reading. So engineering seems like the right path to go. Um, I think it was about two to three weeks into like an intro to biomedical engineering class that I realized what biomedical engineering was. And I was like, this isn't for me uh, because my parents are gonna pay for a four year degree and that's it. So what initially led me to industrial engineering and, and making that shift was, um, looking, I think, at the career development uh, resources we had at the time and realizing that industrial engineers in back in you know the early 2000s had the highest after undergraduate degree placement rate for jobs than any other engineers at RPI. So I was like, well, those are pretty good odds because I need to get a job after this. So I need to take the I need to get a degree so I can get a job. Um, what kept me in IME is, I think, sort of the variety of different ways that you could go. Um, you know, you, you get a little taste of all the different types of engineering, or at least I did, right? We had to take certain classes in electrical, mechanical. I got a taste of them and realized, yep, this is not where I need to be. Like, this stuff is really hard for me. But once I got into sort of that IME type of, you know, specific coursework, I realized, oh, we can go in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and learn a whole bunch of different things similar to Jim too. I really enjoyed the management aspect of it. I knew sort of going, going in and getting this degree was good for me because I could understand the technical, but my intention was always to try to take that management route. So having that understanding and having that broad depth of technical knowledge, I think helped me um, you know, be more marketable and be able to kind of go in and learn things quickly, speak the same language, but then have those other skills to sort of project manage and um, program manage and sell myself and, and connect people together. Um, so I, again, I'm also a huge proponent of it. I think it teaches you to think in a way and gives you enough depth in a lot of different areas as opposed to focusing very specifically on one that you can really take your career 
in a variety of different directions because everybody kind of values this skill set whether or not they know what to call it and what they're what they're really looking for but when when you see it and you can kind of see how people act having this background um you're very effective in organizations and can be sort of a utility player and go in a lot of different directions utility player that's that's a good line <laughs> i'm gonna steal that take it all <laughs> Um, question's a little bit different for Susan and Liam, but what made you decide to major in IME and, and for Liam, what made you decide to pursue a post-grad? So we'll, we'll start with Susan. Okay. Um, I initially applied to RPI as only a design innovation and society major, but um, I later added IME after hearing great things um, during an industrial engineering webinar um, similar to this one um, that RPI held for an incoming freshman. Um, I really like how the degree is so flexible because as Jim mentioned before, um, like from the CCPD website, you can see that uh, industrial engineering alum alumni, um, they can essentially work in any industries um, such as consumer products, uh, manufacturing, um, healthcare, financial services, or even like consulting. And um, like on LinkedIn, you can also like track down industrial engineering alumni in various industries. So I did that um, as a fresh, as an incoming freshman. And I found that um, no alumni are locked into one role or one industry. So I really like that about IME. And um, I, I also saw that it's a statistics um, heavy curriculum, which I don't mind. Uh, it's the only math that I don't mind. So I ended up um, choosing and sticking it out with industrial engineering. Yeah. Give me your app. Awesome. <clears throat> so when I came into RPI as an incoming freshman, I came in as similar to, um, I believe Jim and Colleen is more of just someone who always excelled at math, science, and wanted to go into that pathway but didn't really know what I want to do with it so I came in as an undeclared engineer um, had the opportunity to take the one credit seminar where you get the new form of engineering every week and even after that semester I still didn't know what I wanted to do um, I always saw myself as a more uh, hands-on person wanted to be um, out doing as much physical work as I can and really getting out there and not being stuck in one specific role um, and when it really narrowed down to the time where I had to choose a pathway, I chose industrial and management engineering uh, just because of that heavy flexibility that it has. And like everyone has said so far, that just not one way you can go with it. So I knew as choosing this as a major, I wasn't going to be stuck in a role that I was majoring in something that I knew I had to do one or two civic different things with that role. Um, I knew I was going to have a broader opportunity to be able to spread my field and spread my decisions and maybe go into one career and spread to another one. And that's that's what made me choose my undergrad. And when I went into the graduate program, um, the systems engineering program stuck out to me as a program that is very open to it's very interdisciplinary friendly. Um, there's a lot of students. I have a lot of friends that are in, especially from uh, biomedical engineering in um, particular, that go into the systems engineering and technology management program because they have designated pathways, and it's a very um, flexible course load where you have the opportunity to choose a lot of your course in the program. It's not a very set in stone program. So, like, I had the opportunity to do a construction, uh, construction management pathway and was able to factor in some civil engineering courses that kind of correspond to um, what I learned at work. And I knew things that I wanted to learn more about from going at or from experiencing an internship. Um, so, having that opportunity to find a program like that and tailor it towards what I kind of feel like I want to do in the future. Um, but that was one of the main opportunities that. I took from the system engineering technology management program that I would uh, very much recommend that. And that's why I went with that pathway. Very cool. Thanks, Liam. All right, more for Jim and Colleen. What is your day to day function of your position or your industry in general? We'll start with Jim. Okay, so I guess the easiest way to say so I'm, I'm a director in operations, which means I have about uh, 300 people in my organization, right? So um, I've got several managers underneath me that have teams of people, right? So um, I, I do spend a lot of time at a kind of at a higher level, just making sure that we're doing the right things organizationally, um, talking to, uh, obviously talking to a lot of people um, every day. Um, understanding, you know, I look at some of the larger outages that we have, like, why did we, why did we take down 
you know, 30 cell towers uh, in this state? Uh, what was the problem? Have we improved our processes? E everything about IE or IME or ISE is questioning how you do things. Are you doing it? Can you improve it? Can you improve the process? Well, what if we did it this way? Those type of things. So I, I, I have a lot of people that are obviously remotely logging into network equipment. And I tell all of them that if I ever have to log into that network equipment, we are in real big trouble because I have never logged into it, nor will I ever log into it. But, you know, it's various different vendors. It's Cisco, it's Sienna, it's Juniper. It's a lot of the uh, networking technology vendors. So primarily, I would say that's where I spend most of my time is uh, talking to uh, the operation centers, uh, making sure that we're servicing our customers. And obviously there's always a cost component of it. Like IME, there's a, there's, there's always a, what is this costing us? How much are we, what, what's our unit cost rate? What are we doing to try to get it down to be more competitive? Those types of things. So I don't know that I have a typical day to day. I think every day is is a bit of a special and unique day, and there's just something that will pop up. Um, a lot of the a lot of the work I do is project based, so kind of a project or process based. I'd say they're probably the two key areas. So from a process perspective, I kind of orchestrate and and organize all of our regular talent review type of processes. So sitting with our senior leaders to talk through um, their succession plans, right? They're looking at their teams. Is the structure correct? Do we have the right people in the right roles? If we want to grow these people, you know, what would be the next logical steps to fill them out from a development perspective? So people honestly have become my data because um, I am, I think, an engineer at heart, right? So how do how do we take this person and they have these qualities? And these attributes and what experiences do we give them to make them kind of be able to grow to the next level? Um, and I kind of am constantly looking at the processes of how we do these because they, they have to go deep down into the organization. Okay, do we have the right instructions? Are we explaining it the right way? Do they have the right definitions? How can we do these things that make it easy for managers, busy managers like Jim to pick it up and understand what it is right away and not have to call their HR partner and be like, I don't understand what you're asking me to do here, right? So trying to lay it out so that it's easy and it's understandable and you can do it, um, you know, kind of do it as part of your day-to-day -day job of, man you know, managing people. The other thing that I work a lot on would be sort of project-based uh, activities. So a big one that we're, you know, we've been working on this, you know, we merged with Raytheon, UTC and Raytheon merged three years ago. We're looking, you know, we're still in an evolution of looking at our processes. Raytheon did it one way, UTC did it another way. How do we make it, you know, a, a new and better way going forward that we all do together? Um, looking at, um, you know, our workforce strategy and where do we have talent and people located can we move, you know, should we be moving this work offshore? Should we be moving it to a lower cost or a better cost? Should we be insourcing work from vendors? Um, and then how does the sort of how do, you know, what structures do we need to set in place so that people can do their work effectively? What does the organization structure look like? What are the roles and responsibilities that people have? And then do we have the right people or do we need to go get them? Do we need to hire them in? really cool and all of what you said is kim's dream job i'm pretty <laughs> sure <laughs> um she Maybe Kim is looking the hr we can we can talk kim you can give me a call <laughs> i'm i'm serious <laughs> um yeah no absolutely these are our conversations we have every day about processes so yeah. um <clears throat> it's not just organizations it's all the people that work in these organizations it's so, the critical piece that you can't predict as easily right i think yeah. machines and parts and code and all that can be predictable, but people are a bit unpredictable. For sure. That's awesome. Um, I guess to follow up on that is what are job titer, titles that are common in your industry or that, that you've had? Um, I, I guess in IME, it's it's complicated. You, yeah, you mentioned fine. a little bit. It, it's, it really could be anything, um, but if you could go through maybe some of the titles you have or that you've seen other people had in your area. Kind of Jim and Colleen. Yeah. Go ahead, Colleen. Uh, take this one. You yeah. take, take this one. 
So, so I know that there definitely were some jobs when I worked at Sikorsky that they were industrial engineers and they were in charge of the process of like how you manufacture and put things together. I've been, um, I've had other roles in the past when I was in more of a pure play, like operations type of roles where I was, um, like, you know, a lean associate or, a you know, we, we didn't use six Sigma, but that's another one that I think gets very commonly tied lean six Sigma. We called it ACE at one point. Now we're calling it core, but that's really that process improvement expert where, you know, you, you can kind of, that can be a job, right? You can kind of go and be that support to other, um, to other groups, departments, or your own to say, Hey, let's use these tools to take what we do and do it better. Um, and, and understand where the turnbacks are and make those process improvements and, and really dive into it. Um, what else? I think program, program manager, project manager are, are hugely common ones that you would see a lot of people with this type of background in, um, trying to think what else I had one. It, it, if you're interested in supply chain, I think that's another very common field that we see people with industrial engineering backgrounds in. So, uh, um, a buyer, a planner, a master scheduler, um, a commodity manager. I jumped all the way up to commodity manager. They're like, you can figure it out. I'm like, I don't know that I can, but okay. Um, that's where, you know, commodity managers, when you're sort of looking at the, the big, huge strategic agreements and, and working and negotiating the contracts, you're not necessarily placing the order to buy the parts. Um, but a, another, another very key position, I think kind of earlier in career, you would, you could go do if you're interested in supply chain. Buyer planner. Yeah. Anything else come to mind, Jim? You did an excellent job on that. Colleen. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't thing work thing. in HR or anything. I should have these all memorized, right? <laughs> The, the only thing over that a thousand seen, job codes. Yeah. <laughs> that is a plug. You know what all the titles are because you're hiring. Them. <laughs> yeah. I the only That's thing awesome. I've seen in my in my world, systems engineering is, okay. is like a big title. Yeah, planning. You know, a program office. Uh, yeah, like I said, the the, the the Colleen, we're going to steal the utility player. So there's a lot of different titles that. May not now. I, I know when I joined IBM, I went into an industrial engineering group, and we were, you know, IE. I was in IE department, you know, whatever, you know. So, but I, I think those days are probably gone. I so. I, I'm dating myself when I said that. Like that. That was like back in 2006 when I was like the industrial engineering group. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there may, there may be that title may exist, but like, like, um. Well, Liam is talking about going into construction management. I mean, his, his title probably, you know, construction program manager, or I, I don't know even what, what that would be, but that's kind of the, the same theme is that this thing is, is, is can dwarf many, many different fields. So therefore you have a lot of different titles and that's what actually makes it exciting. Yeah. You're not, you're, and I, no disrespect to anybody who's in civil engineering, but you get out with a civil engineering degree, you're going to be a civil engineer. You know, that's, that's that. And, but that's not the case here. Yeah, you could definitely pivot. Liam, you mentioned that it sounds like your job is already lined up um, for when you finish up. What, what, what will be your job title? So when I start for Whiting Turner, my official title will be a project engineer. Um, so mm -hmm. how our company operates is very um, project based. We pick up different contracts. Um, I like to consider Whiting Turner as general contractor. We're kind of the middleman in the whole process. So you have an owner, like Amazon or some company that wants to build. Uh, and I use Amazon example as it's one of the clients who work with very frequently when they, they build these massive manufacturing facilities everywhere and they just want to throw them up everywhere as soon as possible. So they'll hire a company like us and we'll work with a design team who would, would be comprised of people who are civil, civil, industrial, structural, mechanical, or uh, all different fields of engineering that will design the whole process. We'll we'll in, on on intake those drawings and all the different processes and components that go come with it, and our job is to find a way to get the people and we build that building for them essentially. So we're going out, we're getting all the companies, and we're getting them on board to essentially build a building. So that's what that's what we do there. Uh, I think I saw the next question on there was kind of what's your favorite experience. So I guess I can just jump kind yeah, of straight right to that. Um, so I was able to this past summer. I spent my first two years working on a uh, indoor agricultural facility, a big warehouse down in downstate New York. 
Um, so that was definitely a cool experience. And I was able to see that project from pre-construction all the way till the end of it when it was finished. Um, it was a two-year project, so that was a great experience to see a whole project from start to finish when we were in the office designing and doing all the cost stuff and getting all our companies on board to build it. And I think this summer I was able to transition into a slightly different type of construction. Um, some that may interest Jim actually a little bit. It was a project for IBM at their Yorktown facility. Um, so I spent this summer majority of it working on, they have their quantum two computer system. That is their latest and greatest um, system that they're putting in. So I spent this summer um, working on a team that was uh, doing the system and engineer construction management design for removing their quantum one system, which actually ironically enough is if anyone was familiar with RPI purchasing a quantum one system, um, that's the one that we actually have spent um, working on removal of this summer that is coming to RPI soon. And they're now having their new quantum two system, which we were did the build out of it. And I think the coolest thing was seeing um, just how in insanely intricate the um, entire engineering process that goes into something like a some supercomputer is um, seeing all the design teams work on it, um, seeing what it operates under a lot of what we um, felt responsible for was obviously building everything, every possible thing the computer needs. Um, we got a, it's called a cryostat unit. That is what keeps the computer at a cold, cold enough temperature to operate. It actually operates at one degrees Kelvin, which is obviously right above absolute zero. So you really can't get much colder than what, what that computer needs. We had to have it shipped from Finland. So we worked on all of the logistical design to have that piece of equipment shipped, how to get it. We had to ship it into a port in New York city how to ship something that massive through roads from it's, it was about 45 miles from where it came in in the city up to Yorktown, which is down in Westchester, New York. Um, so just having, and obviously it's one of those things that, I mean, you don't find many IMEs in my field, but it's just one of those things that the flexibility of just general management engineering can fall under a more technical management and construction management. So that was definitely one of my cool experiences with, uh, with that this summer. That's huge. And, and the, um, the quantum computer will be at RPI's campus in, in January, is that right? I believe so, yep. I, I think I remember that being brought up at an IME um, faculty meeting, so that, that's super exciting. And and you were a part of that. That's huge. Yep. Well, we'll keep that same question. We'll go to Susan. What was your favorite experience as an intern? Uh, I can't pinpoint a specific experience, but I really like how as intern you have access to internal company resources. A lot of companies, they have like their um, almost Wikipedia site where um, employees or interns can um, like do their own learning on their own free time. So like similar to learning platforms um, like Coursera. And I like how I can take advantage of that to get training and to learn about other topics that interest me besides like the one that I'm obviously getting training on. So um, during during my time at Unilever, I was in the customer experience team, but um, through that learning um, platform, I can also get to learn more about like the planning side. Yeah. Cool. We'll stick with Liam and Susan here um, and we'll focus more on the tech electives. So as an IME, you are required to complete certain tech electives for your degree. Can you tell us a little bit about the tech electives you chose and your overall experience in those courses? Start with Liam. Yeah, so um, one of the tech electives that I would recommend to not only anyone in IME, but just anyone in engineering is engineering project management. Um, that's a course that I took my, uh, actually my second semester sophomore year. So I took it a little earlier on in my curriculum, but, um, I actually almost wish that I had waited a little bit longer to have a little more work experience to almost kind of see how, um, just use the course a little bit differently, but nonetheless was still one of the most valuable courses as I use so many different things. Um, schedule, scheduling was a big thing we learned in that course, uh, a lot of cost management things. Uh, those are very, very applicable to what I do every day in my daily work life as, as I had an intern. Um, that was definitely one of the most important ones. And I guess one of another, another, which another course that gets kind of overlooked too is um, I took a ethics modeling in industrial engineering course. And that was very good. And especially just working in something with construction, you know, you find construction is every day. You see it everywhere and it affects everyone's lives to use that building. So just having a, very background engineering uh, or ethics in engineering, um, being able to experience a course like that, just really understanding how to take pride in your work and just knowing the value of what work you're doing. Um, I definitely think those are two of the most important courses that I took as tech electives. Awesome, thank you. 
Yeah. Susan, what collectives did you choose? Okay, I guess I can build off uh, what Liam said. Um, so far, I've taken um, human performance modeling, quality control, facility design, um, and general manufacturer um, processes. So um, my favorite one would be um, HPN, which is um, human performance modeling, because it looked um, into how how humans perform under like various conditions. So like for example, I remember we looked into um, like journal articles. Um, about nurses in ICUs to see like where they're most stressed and how that impact like um, their post work performance, such as when they're driving um, from work to home and using the eye tracker to see which parts of the environment uh, pilots focus on during flights um, and during landing. So um, I find that course to be pretty interesting because it touched upon like the ergonomics um, of certain aspects and another course. Um, one that I'm actually currently taking is facility design. It looks uh, it looked into workflows and how facilities like uh, warehouses or buildings are designed to be the way they are. Um, overall, uh, from these tech electives, I I would say I learned a lot and uh, it gives me um, some perspective on the areas that industrial engineering consists of and the work they can be applicable in. Yeah. Awesome. I am definitely keeping all those courses. Uh, in my advising hat. Um, these are all courses I've seen a lot that students take, um, but it's nice to hear that they're getting um, good reviews. So, and, and even ethics, I think, has been brought up at every single one of these industry hours. So I've been plugging the, the ISYE course a lot. Um, but moving on, um, so this is for Jim and uh, Colleen. Many students uh, often ask about the type of work engineers do. Um, is your position uh, hands-on? Um, maybe in the beginning of your career, maybe it was more hands-on and now it's more desk oriented. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what category your current job um, falls into? Yeah, so my my current job, I'll, I'll say, you know, I can do it from, from my desk, right? So I'm not touching any equipment or I, I don't have, it's not that sort of thing, but it's, it's talking to like a large operation center and talking to the people that work in my organization where, you know, they receive network alarms and they'll have to look at it and log into devices. So it's IT related type systems work. Um, today we had a, just an example. Today we had a, a number of customers that were down in North Carolina and, um, we learned about it. The we all we always want to be proactive, right? We want we want to be able to receive an alarm as soon as it comes in and try to fix it. So the mean time to repair of something to our customers is is as short as possible. Well, the today's scenario was kind of a worst case scenario in that there was a new kind of error that exhibited itself, and we didn't have the capability to see it. So my folks in the center weren't alerted to it. So you have to hear people reporting problems to you and then try to piece it together because there isn't a uh, there isn't a, 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 a direct correlation as to what's causing it. So, um, you know, we're if you want to call that hands on, you know, it's it's definitely engaged um, in troubleshooting and what's the problem talking to the vendor, a lot of communication with the vendor. We're seeing this error. Should we reload this card? Those types of things. That's what that's what my day is about, basically. My my current job is pretty um, desk oriented as well. I think uh, I would say it's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of talking to people, and then it's a lot of um, behind the computer type of type of work. Um, I'd say earlier in my career, it was a, a bit more hands on. Although you know, I worked. When I was in manufacturing, largely was going to union shops, so I wasn't necessarily touching parts, but I would spend a lot of time on the shop floor if I was kind of working on a project um, where I was trying to, you know, optimize operations or assembly lines, like being on the floor and understanding and seeing how um, products were being manufactured and, you know, talking to the people that were building them and really kind of understanding where their struggles were with whether their tools were in the wrong place or they had the wrong tool or the drawing wasn't matching up with the parts that they were trying to um, put together, right? So that was that was a bit more hands-on, I'd say, um, but not necessarily like getting my hands dirty per se, because you know, you're know you still kind of like overseeing a lot of things. 
I think certain engineers are okay with not being. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say this is one, and and I'd say after after those manufacturing roles, I was really um, looking for something where I could have a job where I could wear nice shoes. So that was important to me, okay. um, being able to wear being able to wear some nice shoes to the office. So. It's funny, one of our previous sessions, she became a materials engineer because she wanted to make shoes. And that, that was a huge part of That's why awesome. she wanted to get into the field. Um, but it's a common theme. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. I, and I think it gives a lot of perspective um, for students to see that there's more to engineering than, you know, physically building things. And of course, engineering processes is one of our most popular classes where students physically build things. And I think it is a good time for them to construct and make their own things. Um, but then they realize down the line that, you know, their actual career isn't necessarily building things and that's okay. Um, Super so. important to understand how things are built and have an appreciation for the challenges that kind of come from that type of work. So, you know, from a from a people perspective, you can relate more to, you know, if you are working in a manufacturing environment, some of the demands that the the workers will have and and having to be able to understand that and and not just trying to over optimize or make something overly efficient without really understanding what people have to go through and oh, they do need to take breaks and oh, sometimes, you know, you get a little tired or having to walk all the way down here to get this isn't necessarily, doesn't make a ton of sense. So I think understanding it, and that's, I think the basis of a lot of things, right? Having that understanding and can put yourself in people's shoes helps tremendously, but you don't actually have to do it every day. That's huge. Exactly. And, and exactly why we put them in, in that class in their first year. For sure. <laughs> All right, this is for everybody. Um, we we kind of have an understanding a little bit of what your undergrad uh, looked like, um, but I guess go into more detail about your internships, your professional groups, or any research, other extracurriculars like Greek life, if that was you know an option for you. Um, and can you make any recommendations to organization or clubs to our current students? So um, I'll start with Jim. We'll start with you. Um. So. And one thing is I did go and be, I got my PE license. Um, I don't know, I, you know, PEs, PE licenses mean different things in different fields. Like if you're a civil engineer, you almost have to get your PE license because you have to stamp drawings and those types of things. Um, from an IE perspective, I just felt like, um, actually in New York State at the time, they didn't even recognize IE as a, as having a license, but the state of Connecticut did. So I took my EIT, which is your engineer and training um, first right out of school. And then you have to work for a while. And I went to the state of Connecticut and actually took my, uh, they have a, they have a, a professional IE program. So I, I had my license. I never really used it in my career. I didn't need to use it, but it was just something that I, felt like if I was ever going to go into a consulting role or something like that, that it would be something like that. So um, other than that, I would say that, um, uh, yeah, that, that's probably the biggest thing. I wasn't involved in Greek life. I was a transfer student in, and uh, you come in as a transfer student and let's, sometimes that doesn't fit because you're already a junior and, you know, you you know, the, the Greek life thing didn't, um, as far as any social clubs, um, you know, I, I I would say that I uh, I am the treasurer of a food pantry. Um, so my financial my and I and some of the things when I walked into the food pantry and saw the processes that they used, um, kind of from my IE roots, just kind of drove me crazy. It's like why are we why are we taking food from this side of the pantry and just moving it over to this side? What well, well, why isn't it organized by date or by expiration date and those sort of things. And then the, the whole finance thing of it was just that came out of me as well. So that's my other passion, I'll say. So. Awesome. That's cool. Are, are, are you involved with the food pantry locally still? Yeah, yeah right now. Yeah, we I, I'm a treasurer of a food pantry that supports about we feed about 200 families every week. Wow. Where, yeah. where is that located? It's located in Gilderland, New York. Yeah, nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's run out of a basement of a church. Um, that's basically where it is. You wouldn't know it was there if you, unless unless you were a clientele of it. Were basically, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, Colleen, any recommendations to our yeah. students? Yeah. So my undergraduate experience was was pretty focused. I um was I was in a sorority. I was an I was a member of Alpha Phi. And I was heavily involved. I was the vice president of program development for Alpha Phi for, I think, two full years, like two full cycles, which took up pretty much all of my abundant spare time, you know, while trying to graduate. So that that was pretty much it. Um, I do think it gave me, you know, a, a really good um, sort of extra thing to have on my resume there because I was in a leadership position at the sorority and program development, you know, I think it was program development, VPPD. Um, was essentially running the house. Uh, the president, we were joking, I was with one of my best friends who was the president uh, a few weeks ago. So we're still friends. It's been a long time. And I was like, yeah, you were really like the figurehead and you were like the face of it. And I was just making the entire house run. Um, so it, it was a great experience and did take up a lot of time kind of outside of, of my degree. So that was that's all I, I remember. I'm sure there's other things that are probably not appropriate for this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well <laughs> it sounds like you were basically an IME for the house anyway. Pretty much, so pretty much. a lot of managing and scheduling and that's exactly. a lot of people. Keeping people um, in line. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Susan, any recommendations? I would say my um, undergraduate experience for the first two years is um, tip like pretty much the same as other types of engineering because we all have to take a set of courses like calculus one, calculus two, uh, physics one, physics two, um, like all the other um, in engineering. And um, I would say I would recommend joining the IISE, uh, the Institute of Industrial Systems Engineering student chapter at RPI. They recently opened up this semester and um, in the future, they will be holding meetings to support IME majors in their professional development uh, with um, IME workshops, um, such as like revising of resumes and etc. And I also joined um, SASE, which stands for Society of Asian Scientists and Engineer and um, Alpha P Mu, which is the Industrial Engineering Honor Society. Yep. It's a great plug. I know they just started um, ISSE, so that's, that's super exciting. They had their own chapter. Um, Liam, what, what were you involved in? What would you recommend? Um, I definitely was one of those people who went out to college trying to do as many possible things as I possibly could and just taking advantage as much as I was while I was here. Um, one of the big things I was able to do is my sophomore year, I got involved in a big undergraduate research thing for a semester. Um, working under Dr. David Mendoza, I got the opportunity to work on a research team uh, comprised of students from Purdue, RPI, and Notre Dame, and it was all about um, engineering, uh, engineering systems in response to COVID-19 and how that kind of shifted everything in the engineering thing. So that was a very cool opportunity to have and be able to work with students and professors from other universities was um, was a great opportunity. Um, as well as I also went the Greek life route. Um, I joined Pi Lambda Phi my freshman year. Um, still held a lot of leadership positions. I spent a year as our vice president of housing, as well as did a year as president of the house. Um, and so that was definitely a lot to, um, as Colleen knows, takes up a lot of your free time just managing those things. I mean, when you have when you have 50 other people that you kind of just got to keep in keep together and make sure everyone's focused on the right things. Um, but it also was just a great thing. I rec would recommend it to everyone. There's so many different opportunities within Greek life to um, find your place, see where you fit best with people. It's it's a great opportunity to have just an outlet from school, um, be able to just be in a nice social environment, meet other people and get to know. I've met some of my closest friends through that, all of RPI, as well as just had so many opportunities with alumni and networks, um, just being able to just meet so many people and holding those leadership positions gave me so many skills that I use. And outside of the just school and RPI environment, just just general, just management and just holding positions that actually make sense, having to meet with the school for a myriad of different things, just always some sort of meeting you got to go to. So that was a good opportunity as well as getting involved in as a member of Alpha Pi Mu as Susan is um, and play just intramural sports as many as you can count. I was just doing every single one, basketball, football, 
soccer, volleyball, just out there. It's, I mean, I spend probably at least three, four days a week up at ECAV just playing some sport, but it's always just great to get out there for an hour and just relax and just run around and enjoy yourself for a little bit. Um, those are some things I also did. I've done uh, three TA positions in my time here. I'm currently a TA for uh, design analysis supply chains, which is one of the uh, real core IME courses. Um, I also did that last fall and did uh, was a TA for another course called um, the same uh, engineering ethics course that I did um, that I took. I was able to do that. So that was just a great opportunity to be able to help other students learn and something that I was able to get a very good understanding of and just help pass that knowledge on and just help out a professor and just get some other just extra extracurricular and hold a small job on campus. So definitely I'm a big, big advocate of just taking advantage of everything that's out there at RPI. There's so much and there's plenty, plenty more than what I did. Yeah, I want to know what your weekly calendar looks like. <laughs> It gets it gets very busy. <laughs> it's a lot going on, but that's that's really good advice. Um, next question. Very often, students will ask, "Do I really need this course to be an engineer and required for their major?" Do you find that to be true? There was like a specific class that you found that was really helpful for your degree. So I'm kind of combining the two questions here, um, and one class that you kind of struggled in. Um, that maybe you found helpful, um, and then maybe go through some of the resources. So uh, kind of a two-parter, but uh, there's something you can reflect on. Um, Liam, we'll, we'll start back with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely, there's there's no class that I didn't find completely useless. Um, I mean, there's plenty of, obviously, and Jim and Colleen can attest that they're probably not doing physics to work at their desk ever after college and that sort of thing. But um, it's just, I think it took me a while to understand that as an engineer, um, problem solving is what your job is going to be every day. And all those difficult courses like differential equations and physics two and all those very engineering intensive courses um, will actually have a place in in your work, not necessarily doing those things, but just having to fight through those rigorous courses and do everything you can to just grind and learn those things is just the fundamental principle of engineering that I think is definitely a, t definitely took me a decent amount of time to understand why those courses are there. Um, but I do feel they're there for a reason. They are good to just really challenge yourself from a problem solving standpoint. Um, but as soon as I got to my third and fourth year, when I started taking a lot of those IME tech electives and diving into the direct and like industrial engineering course load, um, I really, really enjoyed, like I generally enjoyed all those classes and felt like I wanted to learn those things and really did everything I could to just really understand those principles as much as I can, because those are the types of things that I do feel like, even though I'm not, may not be doing statistics every day at my job, but just having a general understanding of how those course works and how those courses really can apply to just anything. And just using something that maybe you learned in a class for a week, but just pop it in your head of just having a background knowledge of those things. I think that's where I found the value in a lot of those courses. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Liam, right? Like, yeah, I don't use physics too. I don't even use differential equations or some of the complicated statistics classes, but I do come across, uh, across problems literally every day that no one taught me how to deal with in school. Um, so the ability to sort of problem solve and try to understand as much as you can and have that basis and that broad depth of knowledge so, you know, you might not be doing it day to day, but you have that understanding of it becomes immensely helpful. I think, yeah, as you go on and then once you start working, you don't stop learning. Um, you know, you constantly and consistently are having to learn. It's just in a different way. It's not necessarily formal schoolwork, but it's being exposed to new things. You know, you go into an industry, you're going to have to learn completely new products. Um, you change companies and you have to learn their, their other project products or what their challenges are or how their market works. Um, so I think, you know, being, you know, going through the schoolwork even before you get to college is really just, it's teaching you how to learn um, and how to, how to retain some of that knowledge and how to solve bigger and harder problems. So what classes that I struggle with, like, frankly, all of them until I got into the IME specific courses. 
the one class that I always would call back on that I was like, I definitely don't use this. Um, I heard last time I was at RPI, they took it out of the curriculum, maybe because of me, laboratory induction to embedded control, ran right into the professor. He's like, we don't make the IMEs take that anymore, Colleen. I was like, oh, good, because I was a disaster in that class. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it, it's tough. You get, like you can't ever design. And, and I think based on how we've been talking for the past hour and a half, right, you can go in so many different directions. It's impossible to say you will ever use this um, or, you know, so and, and you won't ever also learn everything you need to know. Yeah, so from my perspective, again, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna age out here a little bit because I'm older than just about everybody else here. Um, but on the on the on the uh, the honest side, engineering economics. So engineering economics is a class that I took that I still present value, future value. So that does not change, right? Those, those fundamentals are still uh, apply today. Um, I also found that the quality control course that I took at RPI really helped me because even even in my day today last week we were talking there's a quality metric we call it defects per million dpm most people don't in at and don't know what it means it's just a number so oh, it's a number that we didn't meet it and i'm like no that's that's defects per million that's six sigma that's you know three d 3.6 defects per million is is your out standard deviation i mean like no i understand it so from that standpoint um, I found the quality control and the statistics class helpful. Um, my horror story at RPI was a course that I hope that they don't teach or don't make anymore. It was called lumped parameter systems. And it was basically everybody had to take their lumps. So if you meet anybody in, of my years of the 80s or maybe early 90s and you just say, did you take lumps? And you would say everybody took their lumps. So I learned absolutely nothing in the class. I couldn't. I couldn't get, work my way out of a paper bag in the class. Uh, it was one of these that you just took a C and you just were were grateful. <laughs> well, I'm grateful that the two classes that Colleen and Jim mentioned are um, either not required or not offered anymore. So they are making updates. Um, okay. So Kelly, but, you have to do me one favor if you've got to go find somebody at RPI that still remembers lumps and see if they recognize it. I think we got some people to ask. We'll we'll, we'll do some digging. Um, but I, I will tell you, Colleen, embedded control is an option as a tech collective. Um, so yeah, but it was required when path. I was there. Required, was. and I was like, you don't want me touching any of this stuff. Yeah. Like, that's fair. That's fair. I designed I designed the carton that went around our car and it still didn't really work. Fair. I think I would be at the same level. <laughs> yeah. Susan, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, Jim, Colleen and Liam pretty much touch on everything, but I'm just going to say that um, the courses are useful to some extent in the sense that um, it teaches you how to like problem solve. But uh, more so, it provides like a backdrop or an introduction to the work that you're going to be doing. So, like for example, for um, des the design of supply chain um, and an, an analysis, um, my supply chain class gave me like a great introduction on the processes of supply chain, like the planning, procurement, manufacturing, and distribution. But um, I also like had a great learning curve, um, like on the spot for my co-op uh, because. There's always going to be terminology specific um, to the certain industries, like in my case, con the consumer goods industry and uh, company specific acronyms. So, like learning those uh, require um, extra effort and um, also learning how like the departments and teams integrate and overall like the company hierarchies, who's in charge of the, what or or this. And, and then there's also like um, aspects of um, knowing who to reach out for help. And yeah, a lot of overall, like lear the learning comes on the spot and uh, physics 2 was that 1 course that I find particularly challenging. Um, I struggled a lot with it in the beginning, but um, going back to the 2nd part of the question, like what resources I use, I would say, like, reviewing back exams um, is going to be pretty useful, like all the homeworks and um, just overall looking pat, uh, looking back on. All the resources um, that you have, such as your past labs, assignments, and quizzes, and um, it wasn't available back then. But um, one thing that I find particularly helpful these days is um, I asked ChatGPT to explain 
concepts um, to me as if I was an elementary school student. So that's one new resources. Um, that that's one new resource that students nowadays can use. That's helpful. <laughs> I think a lot oh, sorry, of we didn't have that back in the day. Right. GPT. <laughs> that's huge, and and maybe I'll write that for myself. Um, because I, I think the biggest part as students and engineering students in particular is they have to verbalize what they're doing back and and verbalize it as if I were um, an elementary school student, which honestly, my knowledge is probably similar. Um, so we're here to guide you, but I love when students can you know explain to me what, what projects they're working on and how it can directly impact people's lives. Um, so and, and I think an IME does that every day. Um, but I guess that leads into our next question too. Based off your experience, are there courses that would help strengthen your markability as an IME seeking employment? Um, let's start with Jim. Um, interesting. I, I, you know, I, 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 obviously anything related to processes, technology insertion, how technology has changed processes. Right. What I find at work today is that we've done the same thing over and over again, but nobody has thought about, well, there's new ways to do this now. So, you know, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to do it the same way. I mean, um, I've done a lot of automating of things uh, inside of our operations where I say, well, what? simply like getting somebody to go out and look at a piece of equipment out in the field. It's like, well, a human had to touch this and a human had to diagnose this. We can automate this. I mean, what 99% of the time we're doing the same thing. We're going through certain routines, entering in certain commands. If we find that we get the following results, we dispatch somebody to go out and look at it. And a lot of that. So, Anything I would say along the lines of just processes and systems and technology related, you know, th those sort of things. Obviously, chat G GBT is a perfect example. You know, there's so much out there. This whole AI field is just exploding and it almost scares you a little bit. It's like, you know, are we all going to be here? You know, <laughs> type of thing. But um, yeah, so that, that would be my response. Awesome. We do have a AI minor nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to complete, to be honest. I think it might require data structures. So not many of our students will want to do it, but maybe they do. Um, but just, just putting that out there, a little plug, um, if students see the prerequisites that they qualify. Um, uh, and let's let's move on to Colleen. What what would you say? Yeah, I would say um, you know things that will make you successful, kind of as you transition from academia into a more professional world. So communications, both written and verbal. I think to an earlier point, you've got to be able to explain what you're doing in a clear and concise way that everybody can understand. A lot of times, you're going to be going you know into roles where your boss might not really understand kind of the technicalities of what you're doing. Um, so, so the ability to communicate both written and verbal, I think, is incredibly important. And anything you can take to sort of bolster that ability will will make you more marketable and more you know valuable in an organization. I think the other is um, you know a sense of financial acumen. How you know what what you're working on and how you know how budgets work and how you can drive costs out of things and having a good understanding of how business and finance works. Um, so you can kind of really understand how what you're doing kind of fits into the overall picture. Those would be the two that I think are the most important that we definitely see kind of sometimes lacking in people with technical backgrounds. That's awesome. Thank you. Susan, what would you say? Uh, I would say any courses that gets you um, working with data are valuable, such as um, ISYE 4140, which is statistical analysis, I believe. Um, human performance modeling, I also find pretty helpful because um, the, our professor forced us to use Python and uh, Excel, um, which are two of the most important like data science tools out there. And discrete event simulation, um, that would be pretty helpful as well because of the same reasons. And like, I, I just overall believe that um, knowing how to manipulate data is important in today's world. And Liam. 
Yeah, I think kind of just bouncing off more of what Colleen said, too, about um, a lot of financial courses. Uh, I think one of the good things about the system engineering co- uh, curriculum is it's required me to take a finance, a graduate level financial management course, as well as an accounting course. And kind of what Jim said about the engineering economics course, just because um, money is everywhere, no matter what field you're going to be going into, cost is going to be some sort of factor in what you're working with, no matter what. So just learning the ins and outs of any anything you can learn about finances money um anything along those lines cost management value engineering all those sort of things i think that's some people that a lot of people coming out of very technical programs do lack and I, that's why i've been very happy to be able to immerse myself in those courses and just learn as much as i can about those things cool yeah that that's huge and i think a lot of students are hopefully realizing that. <laughs> um, but Liam, we'll, we'll keep it with you. Um, I know we're running out of time here, but do, do you recommend a postgraduate degree at, as you know, you're, you're kind of into yours? Um, do you find it valuable and it would help your markability? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely feel it so. Um, one of the reasons being too is four years, just not a lot of time here too. And I think I found a lot of value in being able to have a program tailored to what I really figured out what I want to do. Um, a lot of people just still, even going into their senior year, just don't know where they want to end up, what they want to do, or what path they want to go to. Uh, so having the extra time to really um, take some courses that I know that are really going to help me grow in my industry as soon as I get there, I think that's definitely one of my main recommendations that I can give, as well as the just the co-terminal program, RPI, just rolling right into your master's right over. Um, as my advisor always said, you'll have Unless your company's paying for it, you'll have few chances to get a cheaper master's degree than just rolling right into the co terminal program. Um, so that's definitely two of my biggest recommendations. And also, as someone who has just really enjoyed working through my internships as much, I feel like I was always a person who just wouldn't want to go back to school in the future. So just having the co term program, just going right into the fifth year and just getting it done, getting it out of the way, and then just going into the workforce after that, that's definitely uh, was always very intriguing to me. And I feel like that's was uh, one of my biggest recommendations that I would give. Cool. Thanks, Liam. All right, we're going to do our final round here. Um, what do you wish you knew as a first year college student and any last advice you would give to our undeclared students considering IME? And we'll start with uh, you, Jim. So I just want to say one thing before we fire Liam and Susan, you're going to both make IME proud. I can tell you that right now. You you both got great futures ahead of you. Um, I'm envious. I've got 38 years in the workforce, and I I wish I was starting again with with where you are. So um, so I guess as far as to the students out there, potential students out there, I would just tell you that be an IME career, an IME education will not steer you wrong. I, I I'm passionate about it. I'm a, I, I, I don't know exactly, I told you kind of how I made my decision, but it was probably the best decision. And I'm just very proud of the program and uh, just all kinds of things. It's a, it's a great, it's a great field to go into. Thanks, Tim. Colleen. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. I, I wish I could go back. I think there's so many things I wish I knew when I was a freshman and it's, you know, I'm here now and, and I did okay. So I'd say, you know, that the IME career and the IME sort of degree was definitely one of the better decisions I've made for myself. It's opened up sort of a world of, of opportunity for me. And I'm in a place now where I never thought I would be almost 20 years ago when I was at RPI. And it's because this degree and what I learned at school really taught me how to think in a systems way. And I have the ability to solve and take really complex problems and make them really simple um, because that's how they taught me to to use my brain and and break down all those barriers and really kind of just be like, okay, yep, we just got to do this and this, and this is the way that we do it. And people are like, I don't understand how you do that. Like, oh, it's just how I was taught. So um, I'd say if you're questioning it, take a class, take the seminar, try it out. I, I would not... I think everyone would benefit from it and the world needs more people that have this type of background. Um, and there's always going to be job opportunities for, for the, for people with industrial engineering backgrounds. Cool. Susan. 
Yeah, like um, to echo off of what Colleen and Jim said, um, choosing IME as my major, I never really regretted it. It's the best decision, decision I could make as a freshman at RPI back then. And um, I would say one general tip would be to make um, work visible because um, that is something I learned um, during my internship because at first I was afraid of presenting my work um, to my manager because I thought it, it wouldn't be good enough or it wouldn't uh, necessarily contribute anything to the team, but not sharing is worse than um, showing um, the work that you have in progress. Um, it kind of goes back to um, what that book by um, Carol, Carol Dweck, uh, I believe it's called Growth Mindset. Um, it's important to foster a growth mindset in whatever you do and to um, be your uh, biggest advocate. Yeah. And Liam. Um, I think as a freshman coming into RPI, um, I definitely was one of those people, people who felt like that I was just going to get through it by myself and just just not just just do what I need to do and just not have to just reach out to people. But I think I very quickly found, especially my freshman year, that your advisors and everything are there for a reason. Um, Valerie, who was my previous advisor when I was a freshman sophomore, um, did a great job of navigating me through the IME, um, navigating me through just everything, planning course loads. Um, I ended up I graduated semester early, so I was always pushing to just fit in as much as, as much as possible. But make sure that it was still feasible at the same time. So reaching out to people, as well as reaching out to people who have already been through it, especially I think Greek life is one of the things that gave me a good opportunity to have older um, older role models, I guess, guys that were seniors, guys that were upperclassmen that had been through it already and just using that as advice and just taking in as much advice as you can take from people, meeting with professors in office hours, going and getting familiar. I've been had the opportunity to get very familiar with a lot of people in the IME department um, I meet with Dr. Liu very frequently, just just ask questions just because they just have so much. They're just the baskets of knowledge that I feel become very unused by students a lot. And they're there and they're super willing to help. And almost I've never met a professor in the IME department that hasn't been willing to give you advice. Um, so definitely just if you have a question about anything, just reach out to someone and especially in your department, um, get familiar with them, have conversations with them, have lunch with them every now and then, and just feel free to just utilize those resources while they're there. Um, because they have so much knowledge and they can share so much and you can only build yourself by going to them. It's a great plug. My, my, my last plug I'll make is that the intro to ISYE one credit introduction course is offered in the spring only. Um, and if you are interested in IME, it replaces processes. So if you're not looking for that hands-on class, uh, maybe take intro to ISYE. Um, and of course, you know, you could reach out to me or anybody in the hub. Um, and we can help you help change your major or think about what the IME degree looks like with your current course load. So um, that that's my biggest plug. I really am so thankful for all of our panelists tonight. And if you have any questions to all of our students, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I, I believe all of our students' contact information will be available to you as well. So any information that um, you are looking for, we're here to help you um, at RPI, especially in the hub. So um, that ends our presentation. I really appreciate you all being here and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.